See why in just a moment from Matthew chapter 21. I'll begin re reading in verse 1. This is the word of the Lord. And now when they drew near to Jerusalem, that's Jesus and his, his followers, his disciples, and they came to Bethphage at the Mount of Olives, they went, they sent, Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, Go to the village opposite you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Loose them and bring them to me. And if anyone says anything to you, you shall say, Well, the Lord has need of them, and immediately he will send them with you, the donkey and the colt. All this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you. Oh, praise God. Your king is coming to you, lowly and sitting on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. So the disciples went and they did as Jesus commanded. And they brought the donkey and the colt and laid the clothes on him and set him on them. And, and a very great multitude spread their clothes on the road. And others cut down branches, possibly palm branches from the trees. And they spread them on the road. And then the multitudes who were before and those who followed of this procession, they cried, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he had come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? May the Lord bless the reading of his word, the preaching of his word, and the worship of his word as we continue. <laughs>
these songs and they just move me and they stir in me and I, I want to share them because I, I think that we always need to be looking at new ways and, and, and different ways that we can praise God because he's worthy of our time and our effort to be able to sing to him everything that he gives to us and so with that in mind
Let's pray together. Father God, we ask you for grace this morning that your Holy Spirit would speak through me, that it would not be Cody up here speaking and giving his opinions and his thoughts on your word, but it would be your Holy Spirit revealing your word in truth to us. Lord, we ask you for grace that your Spirit would take your word and implant it deep within us and that it would bear fruit, that we leave here today treasuring Jesus more than when we came in. And we ask for these graces for our greatest good into your greatest glory. And amen. As we come together this morning to participate in the Lord's Supper, we see that Jesus did not command us to remember his suffering uh, through some kind of complex ritual or with great pomp and circumstance. It's very simple. The Lord just asks us to come together and to share in a meal, and it's nothing elaborate. It's just two simple elements. It's food and drink, bread and wine. But like all of God's commandments, there's an unfathomable depth and a great purpose to everything he asks us to do, including this table. And if we were to go all the way back to Genesis 1, we see God create man and woman in his image. They could feel and they could reason and they could relate and they could communicate just as God does. But he creates in them a difference. He denies them something of his character, of his traits. Unlike himself, man, us, we are not self-sustaining. That even our parents in their sinless state, God designed man to require something outside of himself in order to survive. That's right. We look back at Genesis 129, and God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the earth, and every tree with excuse me, every tree with seed in its fruit, you shall have them for food. And food is just so commonplace, we just take it for granted. But for Adam and Eve, this was new. I mean, they were figuring out existence. You know, Adam was, was created and, and feeling and touching and seeing and smelling and things for the first time. It was all new. And so God had built into them this taste and hunger and this desire for food, and they were discovering it for the very first time, even as they went through the garden and they reached into the trees and they ate and were satisfied for the first time. But we have to recognize that in his creating, God was not forced or obligated to create a world in which we would have food. He didn't have to create a world in which his creatures would be dependent, just as he wasn't forced to create light or heat or any of the other thousand physical phenomena that we are so used to, that, that we wrap our brains around day after day. So God freely and in his wisdom, he made a deliberate choice that in order to sustain life, that another life must die whether that be a plant or an animal, or in the case of our Lord's table this morning, a man. And so not only did God create in us a need for food, we see that theme traced through all Scripture. He created, he charged the very first man, the first woman, for caring for a garden full of food. Mm -hmm. He even ordained that the command of what to eat and what not to eat would be the test of Adam and Eve's obedience. Right. If we move forward into Israel, he gives them a series of laws about what to eat and what not to eat. He commands meals and feasts that are tied to uh, times of remembrance and celebration. And when we come to the New Testament, we see that theme continue on in the life of Jesus. We see our God eating with sinners. We see him feeding multitudes in his miracles. And if we follow that thread right up through the end of Scripture into John's Revelation we're going to see that Jesus and his church give one final invitation to sinners in the last verses of his word when it says, let the one who is thirsty come. Yes. Let the one who mm -hmm. desires take the water of life without price. And so the point I'm trying to make this morning or the kind of thought I want us to be aware of is that God places a very mysterious and a powerful emphasis on food throughout all of Scripture. And what I'm telling you this morning is that God gave us this need for food, that we have hunger and taste and desire, that he gave us these senses so that he might one day use it to glorify his son. And that's going to bring us to our sermon text this morning. So if you'll turn with me to Deuteronomy 8, we're going to be in verses 2 and 3. If you've been here the last few weeks, you'll probably feel right at home 
here in this book as Bill's been taking us through the book of Joshua, and that's required him to, to dip back into Deuteronomy at times to provide some context for what's going on. Uh, and if you're not familiar with the book of Deuteronomy, it's basically it's a record of a series of speeches by Moses. Uh, the people of Israel are about to enter into the promised land, and he's reminding them of God's promises and God's commands. He's prepping them. Moses knows that he's going to die. He's not going to make it into the promised land with them. and He's using all the time he has left to point them to the Lord. And so what we're going to focus specifically this morning is on Moses' commentary on the manna in the wilderness. So real quick, if you don't know that story, um, God's people are in the desert. There's nothing to eat. We think there was upwards of a million people, and that's, that's a lot of mouths to feed. And so God provides food. Day in and day out, this food called manna would fall from the sky, and they would collect it, and they would make bread. And the Bible describes what it tasted like. And for over 40 years, uh, the people were fed this way. And so let's look at Moses' commentary together. And you shall remember the whole way that the Lord your God has led you these 40 years in the wilderness, that he might humble you, testing you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. And he humbled you and let you hunger and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Amen. You may remember that Jesus quoted that when he was tempted in the wilderness. But that's, that's a sermon for a different time. I'll, I'll get up on a rabbit trail. But what Moses has done, Moses reminds us that for 40 years, God has sustained his people. Day in, day out, food is falling from the sky. And his people did not work for it. They were not praying for it. And they certainly did not receive it as reward for their obedience. Those who, if you know the story, those who longed to return to, the Egypt, to Egypt ate every day and were filled. And those who worshipped the golden calf ate every day and were filled. And those who grumbled against their leader Moses that God had put over them, they ate and they were filled day after day, 40 years. And so daily God has sustained his people as an act of free and unearned grace in spite of their sin. Glory. But Moses is revealing to us that God's feeding of his people in the wilderness was more than just a meeting of their physical needs. In fact, if you only glance at a map and you see the route that Israel took, God could have just sent them north by the Mediterranean coast. They would have had all the food that they needed. But he doesn't. He sends them south, deep into the desert wilderness. And the text tells us why. So he could humble them. They needed to see that their strength and survival did not come from this caravan of upwards of a million people who had been hardened in the adversity of slavery. Right? These were a tough people, but they needed to know that that would fail them. We know that they left Egypt wealthy, flocks and herds and silver and gold. You know, the Egyptians were glad to see them go. It's like, take it, take it all, just leave. And they needed to see that all that silver and gold and all those flocks and herds could not save them. God needed to teach them that he, Yahweh, alone nourished and sustained them. And the way that he wanted to teach that to them was not in like a one-time event. It was day by day, week by week, and year by year as they saw his grace never run out. The manna kept falling. Now, I don't know about you, but if I would think if I was with the people of Israel and I knew that you know, the night before, I'd been worshiping the golden calf, right? And then Moses comes down off the mountain and scares us all half to death. I'm not expecting manna to fall the next day. I'm not expecting God's grace. I'm expecting to starve, and yet it comes. So God's teaching them about his character. But that's not everything that God was doing here. Moses is pointing still to an even greater reality. He's pointing out that man has a need that's just as pressing as, and just as vital as food and drink. That there's something in our hearts and in our minds and in our souls that we need that only God can supply. So just to revisit the verse, he says, He humbled you, he let you hunger and fed you with manna, which you did not know your fathers know, that he might make you what? That he might... Make sure that you were full. Make sure your physical bodies were taken care of. No, that he might make you know that man does not live by bread alone, but 
but man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Mm. Now you might look at that verse and you say, well, clearly he's talking about God's law, right? He's talking about these commands. That Moses is just saying that following God's law is just as important as eating, to which I would say yes, and there's more. And I say and because God's law is good. We know it's good. It was made for our good. But one of the most dangerous lies that you could ever believe is that the law of God can bring you life. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 56, he says the power of sin is what? Our weakness? Our brokenness? No, he says the power of sin is the law, is God's law. God's law is good, but it condemns us. God's law only serves to damn us further. God's law is a mirror into which we look and we see the reality of our sinfulness. We have the commands, but the obedience cannot make us pure. That's right. No man looks into the perfect law of God and comes away feeling joyful and lighthearted. No. You don't sit down and read the Ten Commandments and think, man, I knocked it out of the park. Mm. <laughs> all you're reminded of is all those times that you have failed to meet God's standard. So make no mistake, God's law is good, but it can only bring death. You can follow it all you want. You can hem your clothes with tassels and memorize scripture and perform all the animal sacrifices and do the other thousand things that the law requires, and God will never accept you. And it's something that Paul really clarifies for us in Galatians 2.16. He says, we know that a person is not justified or not made right with God, by works of the law, or by obedience to the rule of conduct, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified, not by the law, but in faith in Christ, and not by works of the law, because works of the law, no one will be justified. He packs that in there three times. You cannot follow the law and be made right before God, because no obedience can erase the stain of our sin. All obedience does is it puts a nice fresh coat of paint over a tomb with a dead man in it. Yeah. Mm. So the law, we recognize, it does bring life in a sense. There's certainly great good that comes through obedience to God's commands. That's a preferable life to, to a life of disobedience. But still, Moses is pointing to something even greater. Moses is not merely talking about the words or commands of God, but what we call the word of God, right. which is Jesus Christ. So as John says of Jesus, in John 1, 1 through 5, he says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him, that's in Jesus, was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. The words of a man reveal what a man is. Jesus said that out of the abundance or out of the overflow of the heart of man speaks. And Jesus came to us out of the overflow of the heart of God. Jesus Christ is called the word of God because he alone reveals God in his totality. If you want to know what God is like, we don't tell people, like, oh, go read the Old Testament and then try to figure out his traits. Now, of course, we could do that. We could see God's gracious actions in uh, the manna in the wilderness. We could see God's justice and his uh, uh, goodness in the punishment of sin in other cases. But if you want to know what God is like, we look at Jesus mm. and we follow his life. Yeah. He is the only word by which a man might live. That's what Moses was pointing forward to when he says that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God, or the word that comes from the mouth of God. So as he pointed out, and John revealed, in him, in Jesus, was life, and that life is the light of men. And before you begin to think I'm stretching the text, I know that sometimes it's kind of like, oh, that's, I think we're doing a little something, a little smoke and mirrors here. Let's let Jesus speak for himself. So I want you to turn over with me to John 6. Uh, we're going to be in verses 47 through 51. <laughs> it 
it's funny, I've heard pastors say oftentimes they love the sound of Bible pages flipping, and I understand what they mean now. <laughs> so, John 6, 47 through 51. This is Jesus speaking. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the man in the wilderness, and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven, so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. If we might focus at the beginning there, when he says, your fathers ate man in the wilderness and they died. There are men and women right now under the terrible and eternal wrath of God who ate that manna day after day after day after day. They saw God's grace. They saw his mercy every morning. They tasted. They saw. They experienced God, and they did not know him. They died. And it's not just talking about a physical death. It's talking about a spiritual death. God began miraculously feeding his people with food from the sky in Exodus 16. Chapter 32, 16 chapters later, weeks, months, maybe up to a year later, those same people got up that morning, collected food that God sent them, ate it, and that evening they melted down their jewelry and made an idol to worship after having experienced that for all that time. And what we see is that we need more than miracles and more than codes of conduct to turn our hearts back to God. Sometimes we think that somehow through all this religious effort that somehow we're going to climb this mountain and we get to the top that we're going to find Jesus there when he's been down there at the bottom waiting for us where we're at the whole time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's why Jesus must tell us that he's the bread of life. He's the living bread that came from heaven. And so don't miss this. If manna was God's provision for the body of his, of his people... It was always intended to point forward to Christ, who is God's provision for the soul of man, which is the much greater need. As Jesus tells us, we, we cannot live, which is to say, we will not see God after death if we do not partake in his suffering and in his death and his resurrection through faith in him, something this table is going to point to this morning. We can do all the religious observances that we want. But if we don't partake in him, we have nothing. And so what we see here is an awesome reality that God has sovereignly decreed from the foundation of the world all the way back before Genesis 1 in the pages that were not written. When God existed for all eternity and had relationship within himself, he decided that when he created this world, a thing must die and that we must take it in so that we could live. Mm. And now we see the reality to which that is pointed when Jesus says, if anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever, and the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. Jesus died so that we might live. And he's the one to whom billions of people who don't know God every day sit down and eat a meal. And every single day they are playing out the glory of God in his Son without even realizing it. Just as people every day when they marry and when they have kids they're pointing to the reality of God as we reflect him in his image Jesus alone is the nourishment that can bring life to a dead heart if we just look through a few verses later in John Jesus tells his followers he says truly truly I say to you unless you eat the flesh of the son of man and drink his blood you have no life in you that was an outrageous teaching Many people left Jesus that day. Even his closest disciples were really shaken. I can't remember who said it, but one of them said, this, this is a hard saying. Mm -hmm. This is difficult. And it was offensive because it was meant to be offensive. God's offer of salvation through Jesus is off-putting to the heart of man because we believe that we can do it ourselves. Right? We, we'd like to think we're so different from our parents in the garden, and in reality we're just like them because we're presented with choice. We can be fed by the food that God provides, the bread from heaven, which is Christ, or we can believe we can take matters into our own hands and that we can feed ourselves and fulfill our deepest needs with law following or atheism or paganism or any of the thousand other fruits out there that promise to fulfill us and fix us 
psychology and science and everything in between. Only Jesus can do what we cannot. If we look at all the things we've talked about, Jesus took the law that brought death and obeyed it perfectly that he might bring life out of the law through his obedience and give it to us. Jesus died the death that we deserve to live in order that the death penalty for our sin might be carried out, that he might give us life through his innocence. And Jesus rose from the dead that we would see his victory over our sin and death and that we might follow a living hope and not a dead one like all those thousands of men and women who said, follow me and are still in their graves today. If you do not know Jesus this morning, this meal that we're about to share is going to mean nothing to you and it's going to do nothing for you. It's just going to be a strange ritual with strange words. Something maybe you've seen before. You're going to be looking at that little plastic cup and be like, what in the world is this? Right? Which, of course, we do for uh, purposes of hygiene and, and making it simple until, this, uh, until COVID is finally over. Please, Lord Jesus. But... If you want to taste and see that the Lord is good, he invites you this morning to come and believe. There is no ceremony. Our Lord is so gracious with us. You don't have to stand on your head and do cartwheels. There's no magic prayer, only faith. Confess to God what you are, that you're a sinner, that you fall short of your own moral standards, much less God's moral standards. We'll turn around and say we hate a liar, and in the next ten minutes we'll lie. Like we love to put a little coat of paint on that tomb. So he invites you this morning. Confess that you're a sinner. Believe that Jesus Christ was sent from heaven to die, to take away your sin and your shame and your punishment for your wrongdoing. And if you have questions, you have struggles, if you want to talk to somebody, please see me or see Bill, our pastor. You can see, where's Chris at? Chris disappeared. There he is, there's Chris. Okay, Chris back there, uh, Peter. We'd be glad to walk you through Scripture and answer all your questions. But for those of us that believe this morning, now we come to the table. Lord's table, Lord's supper, communion, whatever you want to call it. Jesus has asked us to come together to remember Him, to remember the cost of our salvation. We recognize that we need spiritual nourishment. Right? Some of the people will call it the daily gospel. If we throw that buzzword out, it's like we have to be reminded of what we are and the position that we're in. We need to be fed every single day. And one of the ways that Jesus feeds us, that he sustains our faith, is by coming together and sharing this meal. Like the people of Israel, we have to remember our utter helplessness. We can no more feed ourselves spiritually than they could physically in the desert. We have to remember our present condition. Without the help and the constant intervention of the Holy Spirit, we would wander away and our faith would shrivel up and die. And let's remember that without the free and gracious bread of heaven, Jesus Christ, we would starve and die in this wilderness where things will not grow. And we have to remember the suffering and death of our Lord, which is a high cost for sinners, for sinners like us. And we have to count him more precious than the temporary pleasures of sin. But most of all, what we have to see in the Lord's table is that God has sent us nourishment from heaven. That after we have made our own idols and committed our own sins, when we did not and could not deserve it, he sent his son to seek us out and die that we might live. Jesus is not the reward for our obedience. He's not the cherry on top of our spiritual effort. So we come together. And like manna, Jesus comes to us as food in the desert where we can make nothing grow. So if our musicians would come forward, we're going to take a few minutes to prepare ourselves to take this meal together. And I think it goes without saying that the Lord is serious about this meal. It's meant to be taken freely. It's meant to be taken joyfully. But it's also meant to be taken seriously. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 11.27, he says, Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of our Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. So let's take some time this morning to confess and to speak with the Lord and to know that the Lord is gracious. You will never make yourself worthy to sit at this table. 
but the one who invites you to it can.
like him down, he'll come to you. like to take another moment to pray. We're just waiting on the one of our ushers to get back from downstairs. Has everyone been served? If you go ahead and flip this up on the small end and pull that little cap off to on the bread side. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took the bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And 
if you'll flip this over and pull the other side off. It's kind of tricky if you have a young person next to you, make them do it. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. First Corinthians eleven twenty six. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Glory. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. Yes. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for the awesome reality this morning that you invite sinners to eat with you at your table. Lord, we are not worthy, but you have sent the bread of heaven. You have sent your word and flesh, Jesus Christ, for us, that we might know you. And so you accept us at your table. And we thank you for this grace that we cannot deserve. And we ask you that we would praise you for it. And that we would see in it all of your graces and all of your mercies towards us. And your unfathomable love, love through Christ for all eternity. And amen. amen. Let's stand together and sing this last song. Remembering what it is that Christ has done for us.
God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here below. Praise him above and below. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen? Amen. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here below. Praise him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. The Lord hear thee in the day of trouble. The name of the God of Jacob defend thee. Send thee help from the sanctuary and strengthen thee out of Zion. Remember all thy offerings and accept thy burnt sacrifice. Grant thee according to thine own heart and fulfill all thy counsel. We will rejoice in thy salvation and in the name of our God we will set up our banners. The Lord fulfill all your petitions. Now I know that the Lord saves his anointed. He will hear you from his holy heaven with the saving strength of his right hand. Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we will trust in the name of the Lord our God. Yeah. They are brought down and fallen, but we are risen and stand upright. Save, Lord, let the king hear us when we call. May the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ the love of God and the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest and abide with you all now and forevermore. Amen, amen and amen. 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 Join us down please.